Good evening everyone, time for another member update. This is the weekly chart of First Majestic Silver crossed over the silver price. And uh, I had pointed out this chart before and that was, I think it was right around when this gap occurred or actually it was before the gap and I was speculating as to what was gonna be the price action after silver had topped or had kind of slowed down its rise. Well, you can see that it, it gapped up some more. It went up quite a bit from around 18 all the way up to almost 25. You can see almost into new highs. But we've got silver down here at, you know, below 20, around 20. But on the chart here, you can see I've drawn these arrows, the big, huge difference between those two. That is absolutely unprecedented. It, if you want to take it on a percentage basis or if you want to do some kind of beta analysis, it doesn't matter. No matter how you analyze it, that price action is completely unprecedented. Um, you know, we had some differences here where it was actually silver in the 2010 run up, silver was higher than the stock price, and First Majestic caught up real quick and kind of crossed it a little bit but nothing like what we have here just nothing like it so what could we use as a precedent well there's a couple of spots on this chart that you might think of like if we think of this area right here maybe this area here is analogous to this area and if it is what's going to happen to the silver price if this keeps going are we talking about silver catching up to it? I mean, silver catching up to it right now is $45 an ounce silver. Or if it's down around in here, this is where we're actually at, is it $250 silver? So I, I just have no way of making any predictions about what is gonna happen with this because this action is so unprecedented. And uh, the movement in the stock price of First Majestic being in almost new highs uh, and with the rest of the stocks going up, that may say something about the financial assets. We know that the miners often take it on the chin when the general stock market takes it on the chin. Ultimately, the two diverge from each other. I think during the Great Depression was a very good example of where the best stocks, the best returning stocks for the first few years, I believe from say roughly 1930 through 34, 33, were gold miners. A lot of them gave tenfold price returns. Now this doesn't mean that I'm into First Majestic Silver or, you know, investing in it or, you know, promoting it, but just that I'm using it as a, a tool of observation. I, I definitely stand by my original position that I've said for the longest time, that as long as I'm convinced that the price of the precious metals is manipulated, I don't believe that one should invest in, at least I don't believe I should invest in the mining stocks. Because you're essentially investing in a company whose uh, product that they're selling is suppressed in price and that's a good way to go out of business. Now it's quite possible that this may be it and First Majestic and some of these others may be the ones that survive but it's also possible the other kind of precedent that we have is this one here where you can see that we had this run-up in First Majestic and silver did not follow and what happened was from that point, the price of the stock was actually cut in half and the price of silver was nearly cut in half. So what price does that project? That actually is going to project a probably a $10 First Majestic price, maybe $12 First Majestic price, but that could actually project a uh, $8 or $10 silver price if we get some type of financial collapse the stocks completely collapse and then the precious metals and some other assets follow. So I don't know what the result of this chart is going to be, but it's I feel it's going to be fairly explosive when it resolves itself uh, in the direction it's going to go. Now let's look at the debt to the penny, 
this is something that we're going to consider when we're looking at the pensions. We're going to revisit the pensions tonight, but this is the thing I check all the time to see how much the debt is growing. You can see I go exactly a year ago and then where we are today. Exactly a year ago, we were at 18.151 trillion, and you can see we're at 19.385 trillion. So we're still tacking on $1.2 trillion worth of debt every year on the national debt. Now, I think the budget is around 3.6 trillion, or maybe that's the tax revenues, but the percentage that is debt is definitely creeping up. We're going to be rapidly approaching the point where 50% of the money that funds our government, that funds, and a huge amount of that now is transfer payments. But we're going to be approaching a point where 50% of the money that comes to fund our government comes from borrowed money. And who's it borrowed from? We know that we have negative interest rates nearly across the board now. And who is buying all that debt? Well, we know it's the Federal Reserve. So uh, we're, we're going to be printing essentially half of our budget, uh, just printing money. And that's how close that is to the end, I can't say. But that's got to be pretty close to the end. If you're printing 50% of the dollars that you use to fund ongoing government operations, and most of them are transfer payments, then that means that, uh, in my opinion, we're nearing the end. So let's look at the Zero Hedge article here. It's called Unsolvable Math Problem. Public pensions are underfunded by as much as $8 trillion. Now, the absurdity of the assumptions that are made by public pension funds, and I've pointed this out many times, even to this day, even in this age of negative interest rates, we still have the people who run these public pensions building into their projections seven and a half and eight percent returns. And of course, we know that there's no safe instrument that returns anywhere near that. The only thing that we have left that is even showing any kind of return, and it's not 8% a year, but the stock market really is the only thing that is showing any kind of return. Certainly, there are no bonds that can even come close to the returns that they're projecting. But you can see here, even with the rallies into new highs, uh, this actually, at this point to me, technically, not looking at this, uh, not looking at the numbers, not looking at the history, not knowing what it is, but just looking at this chart as I would look at any chart technically. This chart actually looks pretty weak to me. And I'll, I'll show you why if you take, for example, this type of top here where you have this type of, uh, not a cup and saucer, but sort of this V V top formation. You can see that Traditional technical analysis has breakouts of these sorts of formations with pretty strong moves. It goes up and it goes up fairly high as a percentage basis of where it was. So this move that we have here, even though we are in new highs, the size of this move really is not anything of significance on a percentage basis. And again, remember when we're talking about projected returns on pensions, it's not how high the price is, but it's actually how how much of a percentage it returns over the last year. And to get good returns going forward from here, I mean, it's going to have to skyrocket from here. But again, this is the only place that you even have any returns, much less 8% returns. So let's read this an unsolved math problem. Public pensions are underfunded by as much as $8 trillion. Defined benefit pension plans are in many cases a Ponzi scheme. Current assets are used to pay current, loan, current claims in full in spite of insufficient funding to pay future liabilities. Classic Ponzi. But unlike Wall Street and corporate Ponzi schemes, no, no one goes to jail here because the establishment is complicit. Everyone from government officials to union bosses are incentivized to maintain the status quo. Public employees get to sleep better at night by thinking they have a retirement plan, 
Public legislators get to be reelected by union membership while pretending their states are solvent, and union bosses get to keep their jobs while hiding the truth from employees. And let me add that uh, if you add the CAFR information, which I've covered before, that at least 50% of stocks and probably even more are owned by governments. So these plans, these government retirement plans, they are actually uh, what is behind propping up the stock market and that along with printed Federal Reserve money. We even published a note several days ago entitled, Establishment Tries to Suppress Dissident Actuaries Explosive Report on Public Pensions, which pointed out that the American Academy of Actuaries and Society of Actuaries killed a report that would have warned about the implications of lowering long-term expected returns on pension assets. Apparently, the truth was just too scary. Bill Gross has been warning of the unintended consequences of low interest rates for years and reiterated his concerns to Bloomberg recently. Quote, fund managers that have been counting on returns of 7% to 8% may need to adjust that to around 4%. Gross, who runs the $1.5 billion Janus Global Unconstrained Bond Fund, said during an August 5th interview on Bloomberg TV, public pensions, including California's Public Employees Retirement system, and that's CalPERS, the largest in the U.S., are reporting gains of less than 1% for the fiscal year ended June 30th. Now think about that. So they're still projecting returns of 8% a year, 7 and 8% a year, but they're reporting 1%, and this is in a bull market. This is when things are still going a little bit up. They're more sideways, I would say, if you look at the broader stock market. But as far as the indices, they're actually still going up and they're only reporting 1% return. Can you imagine what returns they're going to report when the stock market starts going down? To our great surprise, certain pension funds are finally taking notice. Richard Ingram of Illinois' largest pension fund recently announced that he would be taking another look at long-term returns long-term return expectations, noting that anybody that doesn't consider revisiting what their assumed rate of return is would be ignoring reality. Ingram's Illinois teacher's retirement system is only 41.5% funded and currently assumes annual returns of 7.5%, down from 8% in 2014. We decided to take a look at what would happen if all federal, state, and local pension plans decided to heed the advice of Mr. Gross. As one might suspect, the results are not pleasant. We conservatively assume that public pensions are currently $2 trillion underfunded, $4.5 trillion of assets for $6.5 trillion of liabilities, even though we've seen estimates that suggest $3.5 trillion or more might be more appropriate. We then adjusted the return on asset assumptions down from 7.5% used by most pensions to the 4% suggested by Mr. Gross and found that true public pension underfunding could be closer to $5.5 trillion or over 2.5 times more than current estimates. Others have suggested that returns should be closer to risk-free rates, which would imply an even more draconian $8.4 trillion underfunding. While it should be a substantial overhang for the economy, no one seems to care for now. And thus, we don't expect this issue to be addressed any time in the near future. Certainly, legislators have no incentive to address this issue now. The country's 15 million union employees may not be so happy about supporting their political candidates if they knew their retirement plans were insolvent. Much better to let the system break in 20 years than to fix it with a massive tax increase and subsequent taxpayer bailout after convincing the electorate that the problem was somehow created by top earners not paying their fair share. After all, it's only $23,000 per man, woman, and child. So that's the state of the public pensions. They are disastrous, and I actually believe it's probably much, much worse than this that these numbers aren't accurate. They're probably lying about the numbers. But when we get some kind of a downturn in the stock market, then all of these numbers are going to change dramatically. 
they are always projecting returns, but a bear market can go for a very, very long time. And uh, what happens if the actual returns are negative 8% for, say, 5 or 10 years? Then what happens to those pensions? Well, we know what happens. They go bye-bye. So what would happen to silver? What would happen to gold if a lot of that money or a percentage of that money actually stopped chasing fake returns uh, stop chasing near zero or negative interest rate bond returns and was scared out of stocks and was forced into some kind of safety. Well, you can see what the numbers are. We're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. It's not going to take trillions and trillions of dollars to move the price of silver. It's not even going to take billions of dollars to do that. Just a trickle of any of that money coming into real assets is going to explode the price and it could actually go as high as that first majestic chart is projecting if that's the beginning of the upward move say a projected price of maybe 250 dollars an ounce silver that's quite possible it wouldn't take that much money to come into it to give us a move like that and we'll talk to you next time